What's going on guys, Matt aka Martiln here and welcome back to another video. Today I've been debating a little bit about what kind of video I'm going to be recording and I thought I'd do a nice and quick and short one as opposed to the other videos that I've been doing. So I decided that it'd be a really cool idea to share some of my workflow tips and tricks using Ableton Live to help you guys get quicker and more efficient at using the program. So without any further ado, here are my top 10 Ableton Live 10 tips for working quicker and more efficiently. So tip number one is to learn your keyboard shortcuts. There are a whole heap of keyboard shortcuts inside Ableton Live 10 and some are more useful than others. So I'll just go through a few of my favorite ones. So I've just got a drum loop in here that I'm gonna be demonstrating a lot of my keyboard shortcuts on. Some of the most common ones and the really, really useful ones are things like duplicate, which is command or control D. Just duplicates it out. Another one, obviously copy and paste. So command C to copy and command V, click anywhere, paste it, pretty straightforward stuff. Command S to save the project or control S. Spacebar is obviously to play and to pause, so spacebar, pause. And then there are some more obscure ones, which kind of, to me, count as tips. So following on from this keyboard shortcut tip, some of my favorite keyboard shortcuts are duplicating and deleting time, as well as inserting silence and these ones are slightly more obscure. So what I mean by duplicating time is this. So let's say I have this as kind of like a section, but then I want to repeat that section, but then I've got all of this section here. So what I could do is I could manually grab everything and then drag it all over, but that's a time consuming process. So what I can do instead is I can duplicate this whole section and it'll just put it in between that section and the next section by hitting Command Shift D. Boom. So let's say that instead of duplicating that section, I actually wanted to delete that entire section, but I didn't want to then again, have to drag all of this back after I deleted it. What I can do is hit Command Shift and Delete. And that'll bring everything that's after that section back to where the section that you deleted started. And let's say now I wanna add an entirely new section in between these two sections that are adjacent to each other. And again, I don't wanna to have to grab everything and drag it all over to create this new section. What I'm gonna do is instead select the length of time that I want this new section to be and then hit Command I. And that'll insert a heap of silence. And then we can just start working in this brand new blank section. Number three and one of my honestly favorite kind of keyboard shortcuts is changing the grid size. So there are a few different keyboard shortcuts for doing this, but the main ones that I like to use anyway, are Command 1 and Command 2. And what these do are increase or decrease the grid size by the next beat division. So if I hit Command 1, you'll see that the grid size changed to be a little bit smaller. And if I hit Command 2, you'll see that the grid size gets a little bit bigger. Hit Command 2 again, gets even a little bit bigger. So this is really, really useful when you're working with audio, with MIDI clips, anything like that. It works across anywhere there's a grid. So I could zoom all the way in. I've also got adaptive grid on, by the way, so you can right click and have it on adaptive grid. And then once I'm zoomed in, say I wanna work in a much kind of broader grid, I can hit Command 2 a few times, and now I've got a half note grid, or I can go even finer, zoom in, hit Command 1 a bunch, and work in, what's that, a 64th note grid and then I can keep zooming in and the adaptive grid will kind of help me out there. Another little tip for the grid is if you hit Command 3, switch it to a triplet grid and Command 3 will switch it back and then Command 4 will switch the grid off entirely. Next little keyboard shortcut tip, tip number four is Shift, Alt and Drag. So what does this do? Well, let's say that I split this clip. So there's another keyboard shortcut, Command E to split a clip. Let's say I split this clip up and I duplicate it a few times. So I duplicate this first part of it, right? What I can do now is I can hold down Alt and Shift over the top of this clip, and now I can drag around the audio inside of that clip. So that I can essentially just like splice it up and create some new kind of loops without having to go in and find the parts that I want to duplicate and then reduplicating it and then bringing it back in and everything like that just really, really helps you to work quickly, especially when working with loops. Now you notice that when I was doing that with Alt and Shift, it was dragging it, it was snapping it to the grid. 
If you hold down command whilst you do that, it will drag it free from the grid. So you can get some kind of off grid stuff like that. And this is useful in a whole variety of contexts um, and working with loops is just one of them. So if you find a context that this is useful for you in, drop a comment below, let me know what it is. So kind of further to this idea of keyboard shortcuts and some of these different sh keyboard shortcuts that I've just talked about, what about if there's a function that you really like to use, but it doesn't have a keyboard shortcut associated with it? Well, unlike in other DAWs, Ableton, you can't program certain keyboard shortcuts, but what you can do is key map things. So if you just hit Command K on your keyboard or go up to this right top right hand corner and hit the little key icon, you'll see that a bunch of things kind of highlight in a certain color. And these are all things that you can key map. Now you notice that I've got a bunch of key mappings already set up here. It's things like the MIDI capture I have set to C as well as a few other things within MIDI clips. So if I create a MIDI clip, which is Command Shift and M in a highlighted area, opens up here. Two things that I have MIDI mapped in this MIDI clip view are the preview button and the fold button. I have the preview button mapped to P and the fold button mapped to F. If you don't know what either of these do, basically the preview button, when there's a sound on that particular instrument, so if I just drag in some kind of a bass shot or something, if I have this preview button turned on, if I click in one of those areas, it'll preview the sound with the preview button off. If I click anywhere, it doesn't tell me what it is. The fold button is if I have MIDI notes scattered around like that, bunch of different MIDI notes. If I now fold the clip, it'll only show me the note lanes on which there are actually notes in there. But it can get really annoying having to set up key commands every time you open up a session. Like what's the point of that? It just creates more work. So the next tip, tip number six is default sets or templates. So as you can see, my uh, default set is probably quite different to what yours is when you first open up Ableton. I've got a bunch of things here that I use fairly often in my projects. And again, it's just all to help me work quicker and more efficiently. And if you set up keyboard commands with the keyboard mappings, like I just showed you by opening up this key command menu, hitting on something, and then hitting a key on your keyboard, then save the default set. It will save those keyboard commands to that set. Just to backtrack a little bit, one thing you wanna make sure of when you're setting keyboard commands is to make sure that it's not overriding any other keyboard commands that are already preset within Ableton Live, such as the A key for opening up the automation lanes or the M key for switching to the virtual MIDI keyboard. So to save a default set, what you can do is go to preferences. So you can hit command and comma, and that will open up your preferences. Go to the file folder and it'll say save current set as default set. If you hit save, every time you open up a new Ableton Live set from now on, it's going to open up whatever set with whatever settings and key commands and everything like that you, that you had set up. And it'll just allow you to get started really, really quickly. So tip number seven, further onto this default sets thing, you can actually save your own default audio tracks, MIDI tracks, instruments, and audio effects. So if you, for example, right click on this MIDI track here, you can go right down the bottom, save as default MIDI track. Likewise with audio tracks, if you have any of them, save as a default audio track, right down the bottom of the right click menu. And what this means is that anytime you insert a new audio track, it's going to insert it with whatever plugins, settings, volume, mute, pan, anything like that, that it has on the track when you set that default setting. You can also do this for devices. So say I really liked these particular compressor settings and that's where I always started from. I could right click on the compressor and I could save it as a default preset. And that would mean that whenever I dragged in a compressor onto any channel, that's the settings that would be applied to that compressor. And of course you can also do this with synths or any of Ableton stock devices. So for example, you can make it so the analog doesn't have any release on the envelope or like the filters set down or something like that. You can right click it, save as a default preset. And then anytime you open up an analog, that's the starting point that you're gonna be starting from. 
Tip number eight is utilizing collections and custom folders in the browser. This has saved me huge amounts of time when it comes to dragging in my favorite presets, instruments, sounds, samples, anything like that. So you'll notice that up the top left here in my collections view, I've got a few different collections. I've got some instruments, common effects, plugins, packs, effects, a bunch of different things. The main ones that I utilize are the instruments, the common effects, and the plugins. So to set something in a collection, first of all, what you've got to do is when you hover over the little collections header right here, it'll come up with this edit button. If you click on that, it'll allow you to select or deselect the collections that are available for you to see. Once you've selected the ones you want, you can hit done and you can come back in here and you'll be able to access all of them. You can also rename all these collections once you've set them up. So you can just click on it, hit Command R or right click and rename and name it to something completely different, whatever you wanna use that collection for. So in order to add something to a collection, you just navigate to it in the browser and then click on it. Say I wanted to add erosion to my common effects. I just count which collection that is. So I go one, two, three, four, five, blue, number five, so I can make sure that erosion is selected. Hit the number five on my keyboard and you'll see that a little blue square pops up next to it. And now if I go to my common effects, erosion is there. You can also get rid of things from collections in the exact same way. So you can hover over it in the collection or anywhere in the browser, hit the corresponding number. And then the next time you open up that collection, it won't be there. Tip number nine is basically following on from that tip um, and the previous few tips is to keep organized in your sessions. However you do this, however you wanna do this, I personally like to color code all of my drums and have a certain kind of way in which everything or my sessions are structured as well as organizing my browser, organizing my samples. That's just me personally but I find that if you keep organized in a way that works for you, you'll be able to work a lot quicker and a lot more efficiently and just be able to churn out tracks, sounds, anything that you're doing a lot quicker. One final tip that I'd like to share is something that I don't see a lot of people talking about and I can't actually remember where I learned about it either, but it kind of harkens back to the grid aspect. So you'll see that Ableton's grid here it kind of has like a pseudo grid with it. It's got like a dark gray bit and then a light gray bit and then a dark gray bit and a light gray bit. And these represent kind of four or eight or two or any kind of common bar length division. So you see the more I zoom in, it goes to one bar, then a half bar. And if I zoom out, it kind of changes to one bar, four bars. And then if I zoomed further out, if I could say if I just, duplicated this along so I could zoom further out. Now go to 16 bars, etc. So this is cool, right? This is really, really useful and it allows you to kind of see things really quickly, especially when we're working in dance music or pop music or anything like that, where this kind of four, eight bar, 16 bar structure is really, really common. But what if we add an extra bar? So say this was our intro or whatever, and then I used my command I, my silence, to add an extra bar before this, uh, this chorus bit happened. Now all this grid is thrown out of whack right? So I can't really rely on it, but there's a way that you can reset this pseudo grid and it's by using time signature changes. So if you go up to the top here and hover your mouse over until you get this kind of speaker icon and you right click, you can insert a time signature change. Now we're not going to actually change the time signature at all, but what this is going to do is reset the pseudo grid. You'll see this when I click it. See how now we've inserted this time signature change up here. We're not gonna change the time signature or anything, but now this pseudo grid, this dark gray, light gray grid has reset itself. So now we can work back within this four bar, eight bar, 16 bar structure that we're used to working in and that we don't have to get confused by this pseudo grid that Ableton is putting there to help us. Personally, I found this one really, really useful um, if you do add in extra bars or two bars or anything like that, which I do occasionally, actually fairly often. This just allows me to kind of visualize the arrangement a lot quicker, a lot easier and not get confused. 
So that was a little bit longer than I expected it to be, but those are my top 10 tips for working more quickly and efficiently within Ableton Live 10. If you have any more tips that you personally like, please leave a comment below. Let me know what they are. I'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, if you enjoy my videos, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Check me out over on Instagram. I post there really, really regularly. And I'm constantly working on new music that I'm looking to release and share with all of you guys. Once again, really, really hope you enjoyed the video and hope you're having a great day. Peace.